Hello and welcome back to our webinar series. The first one aired a couple of weeks ago talking about why everyone loves automated testing and what problems it can solve. You can watch that on our website. Today I'm going to talk about why everyone's so bad at automated testing. If we think automated testing is a great thing, why are we so bad at it? So let's take a look at some of the problems we see with test automation. And I, here I have two sections, false positives and false negatives. Starting off with the false positives, when a test case fails but there isn't really a problem. We quite often see this with unpredictable tests. Tests where if you run them, say, five times, they fail once or twice. This is almost one of the worst problems I see in automation. Tests where you don't quite believe the results. How many times have we been guilty of saying, oh, that test failed. No, my code change didn't do that. Let's rerun it and see if it passes. Every time that happens, it degrades your trust in the test suite. Testing the wrong thing. I quite often describe this as testing the implementation, not the behavior. Let's imagine a simple calculator and we have a test that says, press the bottom left hand button. Then, pros then press a button on the top row. Then press the bottom right hand button. Then press the top right hand button and the answer is three. Well, for most calculators that would be one plus two equals three. But what happens if the layout of the keys changes? Maybe the symbols end up down the side rather than on the top row. This test will fail. It's not really indicating that there's a problem, it's just indicating that the layout changed. Much better would be press button 1, press plus button, press two, button 2, press the equals button. This test won't fail as the keys move around. And it will prove that the behaviour, 1 plus 2 equals 3, continues to work as the buttons move around. So, testing the implementation leads to brittle tests and it leads to um, a higher maintenance cost in maintaining the tests. Let's think about false negatives. False negatives are where the tests pass, but really there's a problem in the system that the tests haven't identified. So, how can we get false negatives? Well, I suppose the obvious answer is low coverage. You haven't actually written any tests that cover that area of the code. Then we have lack of asserts. And if we think specifically about unit testing here, we can write a test that covers the code path, but unless we actually write an assert at the end of that test, it's not really testing anything. All it's showing is that the program didn't crash. So I've said here at the end, when tests are unpredictable, people stop believing the results. And I think this is crucial here. The false positives are almost worse than the false negatives. Because as soon as people stop believing the results of the test, they're not going to believe the test is telling them there's a real problem. So I think overall, having highlighted a few reasons why we're bad at doing test automation or writing unit tests, the thing that we're really, really bad at is allowing unpredictable tests, non-deterministic tests to end up in our test suite and diminishing the return that we get. So before we talk about how to write good unit tests, let's talk about what makes a good unit test. 
So here we have a list of things that make uh, a particular unit test a good test case. The first one, testing one thing. Sometimes this seems counterintuitive. Sometimes when you're writing a test, you think, oh, I can check that, I can check this, I can check five or six different things with this one test case. But the problem is, when that test case fails, you don't know immediately what the problem is. By testing one thing, one specific piece of behavior per test, you know when that test fails exactly what's broken in your product. Testing the behavior, not the implementation. We've already talked about using the example of a calculator where testing the implementation leads to a more brittle test case. And I think the key point here is implementations change more regularly than the behavior of the program. And what we want to do is make sure that as people change the implementation, maybe through refactoring, maybe through changing dependencies, that the behavior of the system is preserved. And that's where the unit tests will really come into their own. Writing deterministic tests. So I spoke earlier about how test cases that are unpredictable are bad. So we don't want to have any tests that are relying on, say, a random number being in a particular range, or they're relying on a certain date or time or certain speed of test execution. For unit testing, we want to make sure that if the product functionally does what it did before the test cases pass. Uh, the final point here, writing readable and maintainable tests. Ultimately, the test case is at its most use when it fails, when it points out a problem to a developer. By the unit test failing, a developer knows that they've broken or changed a piece of behavior. So writing test cases that are readable and maintainable is crucial because if the developer, it might be you, 6, 12, 18 months down the line, or it might be someone completely different who looks at your test case and goes, what on earth is this testing? Unless they understand how that test case works, what it's trying to achieve, and they can edit it, they are likely to delete it, and that's bad. So now we've looked at a few things that can make a unit test good. Let's talk about how we can get started on writing unit tests. I think the first point that's worth considering here is that the first test takes so much longer than writing your second test. When you write in your first unit test, you have to make sure you've got all the dependencies, for example, JUnit and any other dependencies you want to use, any other frameworks. You need to ha make sure you have an environment where you can run those unit tests. You probably want to have a CI environment that's running the unit tests. You need to make sure that appropriate reports are being produced. Do you want to measure code coverage? Do you want to measure number of tests? Do you want to add in any uh, extra logging, like ensuring that coverage or uh, uh, coverage doesn't decrease whilst you're running your test cases? Do you want to use a tool such as Sonicube to measure your quality of your test cases? All of these things come into play when you write your first test case. Once you've written your first test case, you have a framework, you have a structure and writing the second test case is a lot quicker. So my key piece of advice here would be pick something simple for your first test and focus on getting the framework right. And then with the future tests, you can focus on making sure you've got all the behaviors you want covered. Running tests in CI. It is very important to make sure you're doing 
continuous integration with your unit tests. As soon as you stop running the unit tests regularly, you will find that their usefulness starts to degrade, that some of them will start to fail, and that those, won't, those failures won't be picked up at the time the code is about to be merged in. So making sure that when you're adding new commits into your, uh, your master branch or your develop branch, that you are have a clean bill of health from your unit tests. A lot of tools, a lot of uh, tools that check code quality will ignore the test directory. I think this is a big mistake. If you've got a tool set that is measuring the quality of the code, if it's if you've got a linter that's applying coding style guides uh, on your project, make sure they cover your test directory. Your test code needs to be of the same quality as your production code. At the end of the day, you wouldn't accept people pushing in poor quality code that causes the build to break, causes your code not to compile. In the same way, you shouldn't be allowing people to check in poor quality tests that can cause a CI to break. And the best way to do this and the best way to encourage high quality standards is to ensure that you're holding your test code to the same standard as your product code. Finally, setting realistic and measurable goals. Obviously, if you're setting out on a journey of adding unit tests, you've probably already got a product. You've probably already got quite a lot of code that you want to cover. So you need to think about how are you going to start that journey? How are you, which areas of the code base are you going to tackle first? Now the obvious answer to this is to look at the high risk areas of the code. Start looking at the areas that you know have defects in them. Start looking at the areas that have high frequency of changes. You can pull all of these stats from your source code management system and kind of cross-reference that with other pieces like bug tracking databases to try and get an idea of where the critical code is. But also, you'll probably find you know as a developer some of the code that you think's a little bit flaky, it's got some problems. That might be a good place to start. Of course, being a webinar from DiffBlue, I'm going to talk a little bit about DiffBlue Cover here. DiffBlue Cover will automatically generate unit tests for your existing code base. So when you're setting out on your automation effort, great way to get started is to use DiffBlue Cover, run it across the whole repository, and then you've got a great kind of starting point for adding more and more unit tests on top of to achieve the goals you ultimately want to get to. So we've got to the end of my slides and it's time for a little bit of Q&A. And we've already got some questions people have asked. So the first one here, what if you don't know what the original outcome of the code being tested was supposed to be? Okay. So I'm going to assume here we're talking a little bit about some legacy code. Not really sure what the requirements were. We're going to find it very difficult to test the expected behavior of this code because we don't really know what it is. I think the first part to, or to thinking about this question is, is this code in production? If it is, what we can do is assume that concurrent behavior is okay. If you can assume current behavior is okay, then you can write tests for the current behavior. That way, you will be alerted to any time when you change that behavior. As you change that behavior, you need to make a choice. Is it a good change or a bad change? But ultimately, there's power in knowing that that behavior has changed. Um, next question, how do you know when not to write a test for something? 
This is a great question. Um, when wouldn't we write an automated test? When wouldn't we write a unit test? Well, in my view, when the test is not going to add any value. And typically, this comes with very, very simple methods that you're trying to test. So if you're looking at something like a getter or a setter or a constructor, it's not very valuable to write a specific test case for that code because you can look at that code and you can tell whether there's a bug in it just by inspecting the three or four lines. Now, of course, I am making the assumption here that you've not put any business logic into these methods. As soon as you put the business logic in, then it will become valuable to test. Uh, next question. When should we mock something? Oh, that's an excellent question. And we have a blog on this topic coming up soon. So I will point out the obvious things to mock, for example, database access, web requests, things that go outside of the system. But I know we've got some great content coming up on this. So take a look at our website and Twitter to see when we release that blog. Uh, finally, how do you tackle different code styles? Uh, for example, test cases laid out arrange, act, assert versus putting everything in one line. Okay, there are lots of different styles for writing test cases and there's a little bit of personal preference that comes in here. But let's also remember that the Test cases need to be useful to yourself when you come back to look at this code and to other people. So in terms of coding style, I would definitely refer back to the coding standards that you apply to the whole repository. And it would be a great uh, answer to this to have a specific coding style for your test to cover things like, do you always have an arrange act assert section? Or do you have a different style of laying out your test cases? Do you have um, messages with every assert or is that superfluous in your environment? These kind of questions are very much individual choice. But what works best is being consistent across the repository. OK, so that concludes the Q&A section and concludes our webinar. So do keep an eye on our website and our Twitter feed for the next webinar in the series. And thank you for listening.